Well, good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to be getting started in just a moment. I'd like to just take a moment to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. I'm sure you'll go away with many insights and wonderful thoughts that you'll utilize in your lives of faith. So as we begin this evening, let's take a moment to pray. I'd like to invite Mary Weisensell forward to offer our prayer this evening. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together this evening and learn about the Catholic social justice teachings. We ask that you touch our hearts and minds so that they may be open to your word. Help us to always remember that we are your body on earth. Help us to see you in everyone we interact with, and help us to remember that they are all your sons and daughters. May this presentation tonight help us all to become more aware of our role in serving others and spreading your love to all those we meet. Help us to remember that it is our role to serve those around us, just as Jesus did when he washed his disciples' feet. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And thank you, Mary. Um, this evening we have with us two um, speakers who will be sharing with us their thoughts and understandings and learnings of social justice in the Catholic Church. Uh, one of them is Rob Shelley from the Archdiocese. Glad to have you here, Rob. Nice to have you. Thank you for being here. The other is um, Bishop Richard Skelba, native son of Racine. Woohoo! And both will be sharing their insights with us this evening, and I, I'm just thrilled. I can't say it enough. I'm just thrilled that they're here tonight. I'm looking forward to hearing their presentation. So, who's going to begin? Oh, Rachel. Uh, good evening. I'm Rachel Cruz. I'm the director of Religious Ed and um, the Human Concerns. On behalf of St. Rita's Human Concerns Commission, we thank you all for joining us as we begin to explore an important mission in our church, Catholic social teaching. Pope Francis has written, we are called to be holy and living our lives with, with love and bearing witness in everything that we do, where, whenever we find ourselves. When Jesus commissioned his disciples, he told them to teach all the nations to observe that I have commanded you, as we read in Matthew 28. Although Jesus had several commandments, one appropriate way to sum them all up is sum them all up is love God and love one another. Our love for God is simply a recognition of God's love first. God's love and God God's love and Jesus allowed us to love God and love one another. We bear witness to this in our lives as a global church through our parish and everyone in our parishes in charitable activities. The role of the Human Concerns Commission is to help the parish itself and everyone in the parish to love God and love one another. Tonight's presentation is just a beginning. Our speakers will provide an overview of the major themes of justice that are woven through our church and church's teaching and doctrine. You may already know some of these, this work that is occurring within our parish. <clears throat> Our goal is to learn the basics of Catholic social teachings. And in the upcoming session, we will study each theme. And we will think about how we can create and expand our service opportunities to invite more people to become involved in this important work of the church. Um, a few housekeeping notes. Bathrooms are in the back to the left. Um, we will have a little break uh, after 
uh, Bishop Skilba, and we will pass out some cards if you have any questions for either speaker, um, and we will collect those. The cards are in your pews. Thank you. Uh, Bishop, Archbishop, Archbishop, sorry. Bishop Richard Skilba was born in Racine and attended school here, including two years at St. Catherine's High School, before transferring to St. Francis Minor Seminary in Milwaukee to finish high school and begin college studies. He went on to study in Rome, completing an undergraduate degree in philosophy and a graduate degree in theology. He was ordained to the priesthood in Rome for the Archdiocese of Milwaukee in 1959. After a few years later, he returned to Rome where he attended attended school and received an advanced master's degree in sacred scripture, the equivalent of a doctorate degree in biblical studies. He was privileged to be pres present in St. Peter's Basilica for the opening session of the Second Vatican Council in 1962. After returning to the United States, he spent 11 years teaching scripture at St. Francis de Sales Seminary in Milwaukee. In 1976, he was appointed the rectory of this seminary by Archbishop Cousins. Cousins. When ordained as an auxiliary bishop for the Archdiocese of Milwaukee by Archbishop Weekland in 1979, Bishop Skilba became one of America's youngest bishops. He was elected the Archdiocesan Administrator in 2002 and served in the capacity until the Most Reverend Timothy Dolan was installed as Archbishop of Milwaukee. Bishop Skilba continues to serve the Archdiocese of Milwaukee as an auxiliary bishop and the general vicar under the Archdiocese of Dolan and Listecki. In 2010, Required by canon law, he submitted his resignation, which was received by Pope Benedict, uh, received and accepted by Pope Benedict. Bishop Skilba has many other achievements, and we could, we could talk about, but in the interest of time, let's just say that we're privileged and so very happy to have this son of our community and a very special person here tonight. Please welcome Bishop Richard Skilba. Just a quick note, the, the cards are at the ends of the pews there, and we have them there so that during the talk, if you think of a question, write it down then, and I'll collect them after uh, each speaker. So we'll do, when Bishop Skilba is done, I can come around and collect any questions you may have formulated during his talk. And then when Rob comes up, same deal. Write your questions during his talk, and then after he's done, I'll collect the, uh, those questions at that time as well. And we should have ample time at the end to, uh, to ask those questions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, folks. Delighted to come to the north side of the city of, of Racine, being a, you know, a poor south sider, never got this north over the many years. Wonderful to be here. Uh, only 20 minutes to talk about a, just a marvelously extended topic. So I'm going to move along as quickly as I can, but to speak a little bit about my own initial introduction to the whole mystery and wonderful world of the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, I was asked by Archbishop Cousins to begin preparing to teach Scripture. Initially, I was a little frightened about the whole prospect and, and because I had such terrible Scripture teachers. I mean, they were really bad. And, and I suddenly discovered it was exactly where God wanted to be. It's one of those mysteries in life that are surprising. I hope that you've had those same experiences yourself somewhere along the line. You say, this isn't what I thought it would be. It's much more wonderful. Anyway, I uh, ended up uh, at the opening session of Second Vatican Council taking the oath administered by Pope St. Pope John XXIII to be faithful to the teachings of the Council, whatever they would be. Now, when you think about that, in 1962, that should have been a bit unsettling, but it was a wonderful entrance to something new and very much unexpected. Well, anyway, I started studying Scripture in a new and more serious way. I realized very quickly that if Old Testament or First Testament, which is what I prefer to say, if First Testament is going to be the focus of my life, 
then it has to be more than just looking at a text and, and paging through a dictionary and then looking at a text and paging through a dictionary. This had to be a language that became part of my existence. And so, you know, with a certain adventuresome quality that younger people have, and I certainly had it at that point in my life, I went to a school in Jerusalem called the Ulpan Etzion, and it was for new immigrants to Israel who needed to learn the language as quickly as possible so they could get jobs and fit into society. So for two months, wonderful experience uh, with immigrants. I was in a gray cassock. My Israeli young woman teacher was frightened to be a, suddenly a priest in her classroom. She was always frightened to preach, she told me. We became good friends. But six days a week, four hours a day, she only spoke Hebrew. And so it was a quick learning experience for me. But suddenly the language came alive in a new way. And I was introduced to the Hebrew scriptures in a way that had never been possible for me before. Then after I returned, I decided that I needed to know something else about this reality. And so I was part of two archaeological expeditions in Israel, uh, a month each time, digging into the past and trying to understand the past and the way in which the people of Israel lived in the past with um, you know, going to the tells where cities have been built and destroyed and built again and then destroyed and then built again, so they were, they were hills. Uh, and we discovered over a period of time that the best homes were always on the west side of the hill because that's when the breeze, where the breeze from the Mediterranean came in in the evening and cool things down. So there were wonderful homes we discovered when you start digging down, scratching away, three-eighths of an inch at a time to discover where the home was and how it was, how it was arranged and all of that. All of that is, back, is background for what I want to say tonight. In the process of coming to, to fall in love with the scriptures as real languages of expression of faith and evidence of people's lives, I no longer want to say Old versus New Testament. I want to say the First Testament and the Second Testament because I understand that Jesus was a Pharisee. I understand that Jesus was one of the people in the first century who were very active Jewish people. And the Pharisees were special because they believed that it wasn't just the law written down somewhere, the Ten Commandments and the Prophets, etc. It wasn't just the sacrifice in the temple. I mean, this is a holy place, and I recognize that, and I'm conscious of it, as are you. But that meals with families were also very sacred people. That's something that marks the Pharisees that meals, family meals, were important, that they were holy places. And, and so Jesus and the Gospels is often described as having conversations with people at dinner, invited to be a guest at dinner, sometimes complaining about the way in which he was treated by the host because he wasn't offered uh, the proper, the, 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 the courtesies that were offered to people when they were guests. Uh, coming in off the dusty streets, things like that. But he was a Pharisee, and, and he was a person of the Jewish people. He was Jewish thoroughly, and his disciples were Jewish, and only in the, in the middle of the first century did they open the community to non-Jewish members so that all of us who happen to be Gentiles, as I look around, most of us probably are, were all invited in to this community, originally Jewish, that has in itself the seeds of universality. So 
So wh where do I go to talk about this, to set the basis for the Catholic social teaching? Well, I go to scriptures. That's my first love. That's where my roots are in so many unexpected ways. I go to the covenant. The covenant in Exodus is described as, an, as well, I, I like to go to Exodus 20 to 24, and I go to 24 specifically. I brought a book along, I'm not going to read it, the, the, uh, the, the time frame is short tonight. The ritual for the beginning of the covenant is in Exodus 24, and what happened on Mount Sinai, Moses dictating how the people should enter into this covenant with God, having a sacrifice, and then sprinkling the blood of the covenant on the altar, which would be here behind me, and the people. The significance of that was life was in the blood. That's how they understood it. That's how they experienced it. If somebody was injured and was seriously injured and the blood was gradually seeping into the earth, the person was dying. So they understood that life was in the blood. And therefore, if one would sprinkle in the covenant, sprinkle blood on the altar and on the people, it's one life, one family, one bond of human being who share the same life. And, and that was what we celebrate every time we celebrate the Eucharist. This is the blood of the new and eternal covenant. But, but it signified for them and for all of biblical tradition that they were one family. That they were united as people of one family are by birth and by heritage and by destiny. How does one show that one is a member of the same family? Well, you know, the so-called ten words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, who brought you into the, in, in, who brought you into the land of Israel. There are ten, they're not called commandments, they're called ten words in Exodus 20. And the ten words are what we call the Ten Commandments. But, but they are, they're, they're, they're intended, these ten words, ten commandments, they're intended not to be in a courthouse. Every once in a while there's a movement in the country to put the Ten Commandments in a courthouse, you know, somewhere where, where cases are held and judge, justice distributed. Uh, but a courthouse is to adjudicate guilt and responsibility, whereas the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, are intended not to resolve issues, but to open them up, so that thou shalt honor thy parents. And what does it mean to honor one's parents? That, that you know, suggests conversation. What does it mean to respect life? What does it mean to respect family, marriage? In each of the Ten Commandments, which we say commandments, are, are areas that invite conversation. And every one of the, converse, the elements of the Ten Commandments, which is, which is what was proclaimed on Mount Sinai when people were sprinkled with the blood of one sacrifice, one family, that the one family which binds us together, that we care for each other, each of them indicates some element of the faith that holds us together as a single family, worldwide, no matter what language we speak. So it's respect for God's name. I confess, I, I am troubled by the way in which the name of God is just so easily slipped into conversation so easily. The Sabbath, a day dedicated to recognize the preeminence of God in everything we do. Family reality. These are, these are the so-called ten words, the ten commandments. 
Respect for life, family fidelity, no stealing, be truthful, purity of heart, poverty of spirit, that the things that are in our houses or in our closets, they don't own us, we own them, and we use them however we are. So my first introduction to this scriptural foundation of Catholic social teaching is to call us back to recognize that Jesus was a Jewish Pharisee who considered conversation in family very important, who considered that family conversation was at least as important as worship in the temple, because he was a Pharisee, and Pharisees were very, very good people. They got a bad name in early Christianity because of, because of the, the early split between those Jewish folks who decided they would rebel against Roman authority and the Jewish Christians who said, we don't think that's a good idea at this point in history. We really don't think that's a good idea. Revolution, we don't think that's a good idea. But it unfolded in ways that they didn't always anticipate. So I go back to the scriptural foundation of Catholic social teaching. And I go back for a moment to that blood ritual on Mount Sinai in which the blood of the sacrifice was sprinkled on the people and also the altar, reminding everyone that we were one family, God's adopted family, and that we needed to care for each other in ways that respect and demonstrate a single family. Finally, I mean, you kind of scoot through all the scriptures and then come to this, as my, the, the priest I live with kind of reminded me in the course of conversation in and out of the kitchen today, you know, the judgment seen in Matthew's gospel. Matthew structures his whole gospel in five books, like the first five books of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And Matthew's gospel has a judgment scene at the end of it all, end of history, in which the people are gathered together, all the nations, Matthew 25, all the nations gathered together, and, and God takes up the judgment and judges the earth, all the nations, and says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I had no clothes. You gave me something to wear. Enter into the fullness of the kingdom. And people, you know, were told in Matthew's, were, were told in Matthew's parable of that final judgment scene, well, we, we never saw you. When you saw the least of my brother, you saw me. And then that next scene of that final judgment, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was, I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink, I was naked, you gave me nothing to wear. Uh, that same thing reversed and people are condemned. And they say, when did we see you? Well, when you didn't see me in the least of my brothers and sisters, you didn't, you didn't serve me. So, you know, the, the scriptural foundation for Catholic social teaching is found in several places. It's found throughout the scriptures. It's found in the way in which the covenant in Israel on Mount Sinai was introduced by, by a ritual which created one family, one human family among all the Jewish people, and then was opened up to non-Jewish Gentile people, like most of us, so that we became part of the Christian community into which all are invited and all are judged by the way in which we treat each other as members of one family or not. Um, the great grace uh, that Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew introduces, you know, when he sends them out to be, to be witnesses uh, to all nations is uh, a reminder that everything that what we call Catholic social teaching is founded in scriptures, founded in the covenant, founded in the teaching of Jesus, and then somehow 
recognized as part of the way in which everyone who is baptized enters into God's family and enters into a relationship with God and each other that presumes one life, one family, uh, an, a unity that encompasses all of human existence across the whole world, in all cultures, all languages, and all varieties. We recognize God's name. We're called to recognize God's name. I'm troubled by the way in which, I confess, I'm troubled by the way in which so often and so easily people just make reference to the name of God without paying any attention. Uh, I'm you know, called again and again to recognize the Sabbath, seventh day of the week, or the first day of the week in the new creation. The first day of the week is an invitation to recognize the gift of time and the invitation to use it to become more and more a single family that encompasses the whole world and all of history, to recognize the gift of life, the gift of familyhood, and all things that are material possessions. They don't possess us. They're given to us to be used to help support and sustain the whole human family. So that's the background that I bring to your conversation about Catholic social teaching. Um, and I hope it will be something to help us focus on what it is that brings us together. And, and not only that, but what we celebrate, what was celebrated here this morning uh, in the Eucharist, a single family called together uh, and then sent forth. Uh, you know, I, I like to point out the fact that we when we enter the church on a Sunday morning or any morning, we take some holy water and kind of splash it over ourselves and uh, recognize that because of baptism, we're invited into this group of people, but also on the way out the door, we do the same thing. It's because of the Eucharist we share that we bless ourselves and are sent to make the whole world a single family in ways that often we don't think about and often we don't fully appreciate, or maybe most of the time, we don't fully appreciate what it is we're called to be. So, you know, I have all kinds of things I've thought about in the course of the last couple of weeks, but that's what I want to say by way of introduction to the, the series that brings us together. Uh, tonight, Scriptural Foundations for Catholic Social Teaching. Uh, thanks very much, everybody.
kidding. Sorry. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Robert uh, B. Shelady, and he is the director of the Office of Dignity of Human Persons for office in the Catholic Social Responsibility Department at the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. That has to be a very long title on a business card. Uh, his responsibilities include promoting formation on the Catholic social teaching, representing the archdiocese in various local, state, and national organizations, and advocating for social justice in the community. In addition, Rob is the diocesan director for Catholic Relief Services and the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. He has a bachelor's in political science from Marquette University and a law degree from Northwestern University Law School. He practiced, he practiced law in Milwaukee until 1996. Leaving the practice, he earned a PhD in political science from Wisconsin, writing his dissertation on the role of the Vatican in global politics. politics. He taught political science at Marquette in 2003 and 2004 before joining the Archdiocese in the fall of 2004. He and his wife, Teresa, live in Wauwatosa and are members of St. Sebastian Parish in Milwaukee, and they have three adult children and one grandchild. Please welcome Mr. Shelley. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, I'm going to, I'm not used to needing a mic. I have a very, um, I'm a lector at our parish. Well, I'm not really a lector at our parish uh, because of the, the pandemic. Um, I've taken a hiatus, but when I, I do usually lecture, and many years ago when we remember as a St. Peter and Paul, we had a professional actor come in and give us voice lessons uh, before Holy Week. And um, I went home afterwards and I told my wife, Therese, I'm like, you know, the, the, the woman said that I had a very caring voice. And I thought that was great because I don't feel that, you know, I'm kind of a, emotionally a little stiff and all of that. And, and I don't, but the fact that my voice is caring works it. And she's like, Rob, Rob, Rob. She didn't mean that you project care with your voice. She meant that your voice carries that you are loud. I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm not used to using a mic, and so if I stray from the mic, I'll ask that the people in the back give me a little signal that I should move closer to the mic. Um, so thank you all for being here this evening. Really appreciate that. I remember one time we had an event, um, and it was a small event, but um, we had uh, uh, former Lieutenant Governor uh, Margaret Farrow, who just passed away recently, was one of the presenters. And I was talking to her afterwards, and I was grateful for her uh, presentation. And she said, I said, I apologize. That wasn't as many people as we were kind of hoping. And she says, hey, anytime any group of adults gets together to talk about the faith, it's a good thing. Um, and I would continue that to time any time anybody gets together and talks about the faith, it's a good time. So thank you very much uh, for that, for being here tonight. Tonight, I want to give you a brief sampling of the seven themes of Catholic social teaching. This is the kickoff event to a series of events. Um, as Rachel alluded to, there's going to be seven more of these sessions over the next year and a half, each focusing on one of the themes of Catholic social teaching. And so this, my presentation will be fairly rapid going through them, and I hope, as Bishop Skelba mentioned, that it will be an invitation to a conversation, an invitation to a further conversation about each one of the themes. The next thing I want to touch on after I go through the themes is a Catholic approach to social issues a Catholic approach to social issues, or the see, judge, and act model, and a both-and approach. And then just a reminder to all of us that part of living out our faith is doing something on the social issues, doing our part to address the social injustices that exist in our community and in our world uh, today. So. Here's a much younger picture of me. And that is our, my three parts of my uh, talk for this evening. Now, I love the fact that, and I'll talk a little bit about Matthew 25 as well, and I love the fact that Bishop Skelba used Matthew 25 um, as an example in his talk. And Matt, our youngest son, 
is named Matthew, and he is named Matthew because it's, um, well, it's my favorite gospel, um, and my wife went along with going with Matthew. Um, and the other option was Earl, which was her dad's name, which is a great name, but I thought Matthew was a little better name, and that's a, uh, a discussion that I uh, came out on top. But the reason I love Matthew gospel is it has a to-do list for us. I mean, I am a person who needs a to-do list, and Matthew 25 provides a great to-do list for us. But I am jumping ahead in my talk here a little bit. First, I want to talk about the, the seven themes of Catholic social teaching. And up here is the schedule of the different programs that you'll be going through here uh, at St. Rita's in Racine to go in further in depth than these. Now, I want to preface this by, I'm going to use seven, and you had an opportunity to grab a handout like this in the back, and I hope you did. If you didn't, please grab one on the way out. There's no magic number in terms of the principles of Catholic social teaching. You see it presented in several different ways. For example, the Compendium on Catholic Social Teaching talks about five pillars or five principles. Um, Catholic, so Catholic Relief Services had guiding, ten guiding principles of Catholic Social Teaching that informs their ministry throughout the world. Um, these are seven themes that we're going to talk about a little bit tonight and are going to be the focus of the group is the framework that the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has used over the last several years to help again, start that conversation about Catholic social teaching. Like all aspects of our faith, it's something that needs to be studied and prayed about and lived out over a lifetime to totally, to really participate, to authentically participate in our life. And it will change as we get older. And depending on where we are in our lives, what positions we hold in our communities, what roles that we play, our responsibilities under Catholic social teaching will also change. The last thing I want to emphasize on that is that Catholic social teaching is a particular charism of the laity. As much as we respect uh, the pastor, Father Peterson, Bishop Skelba, Deacon Greg, other deacons here in the, in the, in the audience, it's important that Lay Catholics live out Catholic social teaching in their lives. It's our obligation as lay Catholics to bring the gospel to the world in all of its different aspects. So it's a very important thing for the laity to bring forth into the world. Now, I just want to quickly go through the seven themes of Catholic social teaching with you. The first and the foremost is the inherent dignity of every human person. Every human person is created in the image of God. And from the moment of conception until their natural death, they are entitled to love and respect. And all of us are called to recognize that in our neighbors, whether they're across the street, whether they're across the, the country, or whether they're across the world. Each and every human being, from the moment of conception till the natural death, is entitled to love and respect. And that's the foundation of Catholic social teaching. It's where the other teachings flow from that and the importance of the human person. And you'll see that reflected in all the other themes. But this is, again, the fact that we are created in the image of God gives us a particular role to play. It's a, in that recognition that is so important for all aspects of Catholic social teaching. The next theme is, oh, sorry, is the call to family, community, and participation. One of the things that the church teaches is that all human beings are social. Bishop Skelba talked about how people are called into relationship in the covenant, how they are the recognizing that they are one family, one community, sharing these various aspects of their lives. As human beings, we live out our lives in our relationships. 
We have a relationship with God. We have a relationship with each other. And we find our greatest fulfillment in those relationships. We are social beings. We are called to community. We are called to family. We are called to participation. And so it is in those relationships that we see where things can go awry. When those relationships are incorrect, they are out of sync, that's when sin enters into our lives and into our societies. When people are excluded, that is a problem. That's why the church is such an adamant opposition to racism. That's why the church is so supportive of the family, because it is so important in our lives that we have strong families. And when families struggle, then our society struggles. And so it's important that we all live out these relationships and have the opportunity to live out uh, these relationships. There's a term that you'll hear in Catholic social teaching called the common good. And it is defined up there, but it's basically the conditions in our society that allow for the greatest amount of human flourishing and the greatest amount of the flourishing of our communities. And it consists of three things, a respect for the human person, a, uh, the social development and well-being of the group, and peace. And if a society has those three things in it, it will be a society that functions well. And if any of those things don't exist in a society, it is a function that will, it's a, it will be dysfunctional. There will be problems in that society. And so all of us are called to serve the common good. Because this, if the common good is served, it allows all of us to flourish to our greatest God-given potential. The third theme of Catholic social teaching is what's known as rights and responsibilities. And this, this one sometimes challenges us as Americans because we have a good sense of human rights in our society. The United States has a strong tradition of respecting human rights, and we can go back into our Bill of Rights, which was one of the most earliest recognitions of the inherent rights that people have. All human beings, because they are made in the image of God, have certain rights. They're not granted by the state. They are inherent in who we are as people, as we have certain rights to that. The first one is the right to life, but then it's also the right to the things that are necessary for a decent human existence. So the right to food, the right to education, the right to shelter the right to health care, uh, the right to work. Corresponding with these rights are responsibilities. As uh, Pope John XXIII wrote in one of his encyclicals, each human being has inherent rights, but they come with inherent responsibilities. So for example, you have the right to an education but you have the responsibility to study hard and to work and to develop yourself for that. You have the right to health care, but you have a responsibility to take care of yourself, to exercise, to eat right, not to indulge in smoking or uh, alcohol to too great of an extent. Um, we have these responsibilities that go with it. And it's the responsibility part that we often stumble with as an Americans because we're used to thinking about the rights that we have as American citizens, but we often don't think about responsibilities. There's not a bill of responsibilities in the U.S. Constitution. And so it's important for Catholics when we think about this idea of rights and responsibilities, we make sure that we emphasize both aspects of that. That we have, yes, we have rights, but we also have responsibilities that we need to follow through on. The fourth theme of Catholic social teaching is the option for the poor and the vulnerable. God loves each and every one of us. 
every single one of us. However, God loves the poor and the vulnerable even more. And if you go back into scripture, you talk about God's love for widows and orphans, that God protects widows and orphans. And uh, I'm going to still call it, I'll try to call it the First Testament, but I'll slip and call it the Old Testament quite a bit. But in the First Testament, you see that often. And the reason for that is because widows and orphans were the most vulnerable people in those societies. I mean, there, the, a woman didn't have a husband or a father was extremely vulnerable, and in the same way of orphans. And so God looked out for orphans and widows. And in the same way we bring that into our world today, we need to think about how what we do, what our policies affect not only ourselves and our families, but the most vulnerable people in our society. Because it's very easy for us to overlook the poor and the vulnerable. And the poor and the vulnerable certainly don't have people that go into uh, political offices and lobby on their behalf the way that people with more means can afford, or a corporation. A good friend of ours is the Vice President of Public Affairs for Marquette University. She's a very talented woman um, and is definitely somebody that you want on your side. She is tenacious in what she pursues. And she is the chief lobbyist for Marquette University. And she does an excellent job lobbying for Marquette University. And but the people, the poorest people in our society don't have somebody like that unless it's going to be us speaking on their behalf. Babies in the womb don't have a voice unless we give them. Undocumented immigrants don't have a voice unless we give it to them. Again, thinking about the poor and the vulnerable, the most vulnerable um, in our society is a very important aspect of Catholic social teaching. And this is where we get back to Matthew 25. Here is that to-do list that we talked about and that Bishop Scalbo referred to. These are the things that we are called to do as Catholics, to live out the corporal works of mercy. And you'll notice on that list these people who are supposed to help in a way, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the homeless, these are people who are vulnerable. And living out the corporal works of mercy is a way that we live out that option for the poor and the vulnerable. And again, it's an example of how Catholic social teaching is rooted in both church tradition, but also in scripture. Huh. Theme number five is the dignity of work and the rights of workers. As this statement says, the economy is not, the economy must serve people, not people serve the economy. And that goes back to that idea that each of us has inherent dignity. And so our participation in the economy has to respect that dignity. And so people at their workplaces need to be paid a fair wage. They need to have safe working conditions. They have the right to organize labor unions. They have a, people have the right to economic initiative. People have the right to own their own property, the right to private property. And this one is something, this is, this frankly is the, one of the foundations of Catholic social teaching. If you look at modern Catholic social teaching, most of it go back to a Reverum Novarum and Pope Leo when he talks about um, on human labor. And the question that Pope Leo was, was answering was something that came from the United States, not exclusively, but somewhat primarily, is whether or not Catholics could join labor unions. And this was a controversial thing in the late, 19, in the late 18th century, is whether or not Catholics could join labor unions. And what Pope Leo ultimately decided is that absolutely, 
People have the right to a, a right to association. They can join labor unions. And so we have a strong tradition in the Catholic social teaching, one that was expressed oftentimes here in Racine in terms of Catholic involvement with labor unions. Um, Father Tom Seriano helps out at uh, um, our parish at St. Sebastian's, where he did before he retired, and he was talking about how his dad was a labor steward um, at his pace of employment. And so there is this strong tradition of support for labor unions in the Catholic teaching. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that labor unions get everything they want. They have responsibilities. They have an obligation to serve the common good in the same way that businesses do. And so, again, it's important for people to live out the dignity of work and the rights of workers. Theme number six is the idea of solidarity. And this is one you can draw a through line immediately with, between what Bishop Skelba talked about us being one family and this idea of solidarity. And what solidarity talks about is that we have, we are called to love our neighbor. And that call is a universal call. Uh, John Paul II talked about having a feeling, the feeling that we have for our siblings in a healthy relationship with siblings, that love that you have for your sibling, the things that you will do for your sibling, is a love and a feeling that you should have for total strangers. And I remember hearing a talk one time about um, uh, that Feeling, And it reminded me of a time that I was um, driving home from Matthew's uh, baseball practice. And there was, um, I was going down a main street in Milwaukee, uh, 76th Street, which is a, a four-lane street. And people consider it basically, I mean, even... This was 10 years ago. Back then, people considered it basically an interstate then. And so 60 miles an hour uh, was not an uncommon speed um, on 76th Street, unfortunately. Um, but I'm going down 76th Street, and this young man races out in front of us. And he makes it all the way across four lanes, just barely missing our car and a couple of other cars on the way. And I'm like, what? What the heck? Well, then three other young men come racing behind us, chasing him. And I was telling, I was, I was in church the next week, and they were talking about the Good Samaritan story. And I was thinking about, should I have gone back and kind of helped that young man? And I was talking to a friend of ours one time about that. And what they said is that, had that been Matthew being chased across the street, you certainly would have. And he said, frankly, that's what we're all called to be, to have that love for total strangers that we have for the people that we most cherish in our lives. And that's difficult. I am not there yet. I'm working on it. Um, but it is what we're called to be that one human family, and to recognize our common humanity and live that out. The last theme is care for God's creation. And basically that's the idea that we need to recognize that the earth and everything in it is a gift from God. And it's meant for us, but it's meant for everyone. And not only everyone alive today, but for future generations as well. And we need to treat God's creation like a gift in a way that allows us to use it so that we can survive and thrive, but also so that people around the world can survive and thrive and future generations can survive and thrive, especially the most poor and vulnerable. Now, I hope these seven themes have generated a lot of questions for you a lot of thoughts, probably some controversy, I'm thinking, because we are talking about public events and ideas. And we often disagree about the West 
best way to proceed on many of the issues that we talk about, whether it's, uh, whether it's immigration or gun control or abortion or the economy or you name it. I mean, we, we argue about these things. We talk about them a lot. We, political, we have political races that are run on them. And that's, that's all right. Those are good things. But the important thing for us to take from this evening is that the church has some framework for us to think about these issues, to help preface how we participate in our public lives, how we participate in our work lives, in our economic lives, in our cultural lives. And we are called, as lay Catholics, to bring that teaching out into the world. And I want to talk to you a little bit about a way to do that. My office will soon be called Catholic Social Action, in part because it's way too long a name right now, and we can't get it on uh, business cards uh, very easily. Um, but some of you may remember the Catholic Social Action movement of the 1920s, the 1930s, and the 1940s. It was actually very big down in a, in a larger metropolitan area just south of us, and I'm not referring to Kenosha, although I'm sure it was pretty big in Kenosha um, as well. But coming out of that and adopted by uh, John the 23rd was the See, Judge, and Act methodology, the See, Judge, and Act methodology. And so, as Bishop Skelba talked about the final judgment in Matthew 25 and the, um, the sheeps and the goats asking that question, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you naked? That's the first thing we're called to do as Catholics, is to see our world, to look out at our world and to observe it, to participate in it, to be part of our culture to work in it, to be part of the world, but to see it with open eyes and then to judge it in light of Catholic teaching. It's to look at our world and are there areas where the relationships among neighbors are broken? Are there areas where the inherent dignity of the human person is not being recognized? Are there issues that do not reflect the justice of God's love? And if there are, then we are called to act. We are called to act, to correct that issue, to work with others, to make our world reflect God's love for each and every one of us. So see, judge, and act. Now, I wanna also emphasize how the church sees the world. And the church sees the world in a both-and lens, a both-and lens. If you walk away from tonight with anything besides these seven themes, I want that phrase both-and in your head because that's the way we need to look at things. And what do I mean by a both-and response? One of the ways to think about this is what we call the two the two feet of love in action. And just as you're much more stable if you're standing on two feet, if any of you are involved in athletics, you have an athletic stance, whether it's basketball or soccer or wrestling, kind of knees bent, feet solidly on the floor, up on the balls of your feet, you're nice and solid, you're on two feet. And what these two feet are in Catholic social teaching is charity and justice. So what charity is, is, a meet, is meeting the immediate needs of people. So if somebody is hungry, you feed them a meal. If somebody is naked, you give them clothes. If somebody's in prison, you visit them. You live out the corporate works of mercy. You meet their immediate needs on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So that's charity. That's one aspect. The other aspect is justice, is asking a broader question, a more structural question, of why is it that that person is hungry? Why is it that that person doesn't have a coat? 
Why is it that that person um, is in prison? I know St. Rita's is very involved in the community meal at St. Patrick's. That's a wonderful thing. That's a beautiful thing that you're doing to help feed the hunger. You're living out the charge of Matthew 25. But it's important when you do that to think, okay, why is it that these people are coming to this meal? What is it that's holding them back that they're not able to provide for their own families or go to the grocery store and buy food the way most people do in our society? What are the things that might need to change in our society so that these people can live out their inherent dignity and feed themselves? They have a right to food, but they also have a responsibility to provide that for themselves. What's holding them back from doing that? And that, again, is a both-and response, both charity and justice. Now, finally, I want to end my presentation here with just the fact that we are all called as Catholics to do something to address these issues in our society. All of us are called to do something. We are not called to solve these problems by ourselves. We are not called to um, have all the answers, but we are called to do something. And that something's going to depend a lot on where you are in your lives and where you are in the community. I mean, if you own a business, your responsibilities are different than if you work at a business. If you are under the age of 18 and can't vote, your responsibilities are a little bit different than if you're over 18 and can vote. If you're the head of the office for the dignity of the human person and the director for social justice, responsibility, and society, your responses are a little bit different than they are if you are in another position. So again, it, it changes, but it is incumbent on all of us to do something. And one of the problems that we have as Catholics is we, the Catholic Church is huge. It's a massive organization. And so oftentimes we are tempted to say, the church is dealing with that issue. And it's true. The church deals with lots of issues, with lots of different ministries that are doing wonderful, wonderful things. But that, we are then called to do our little part. And here are four possible ways to get involved, all of which, again, depending on your circumstances, may be more effective. Every single person in this room can pray about these issues and to pray for our world to more closely reflect God's love for all of us. That's something we can all do, and we're all called to do it. We can all learn about these issues. What is an issue that speaks to your heart, that you're kind of pulled to? Well, follow that up. That's a, that's a, a prompting of the Spirit that you need to be more involved in whatever that issue is. And there are lots of issues out there for us to get involved with. And not every Catholic is going to be involved in every issue, and that's fine. We need to divide up the work. But it's important for all of us to be involved and to support each other as we are involved in these different issues. We can advocate, and it's very important for us, especially here in the United States where we live in a democracy, we live in the most powerful country in the world, to advocate on behalf of the poor and the vulnerable in particular. Whether you're old enough to vote or not, it doesn't matter. You can still call up your elected officials. They represent you, regardless of your age, and ask them to support a particular bill or to work on a particular issue. For example, next year in 2023, we're going to um, reauthorize the, the U.S. Farm Bill, which is a very important bill for the rural economy. It's a very important bill for any of us who eat. And it's a very important bill because a lot of food and feeding programs are funded through it. And so it's a very important bill to be involved with. And because we live in the Midwest, our elected officials tend to be a lot more influential on agricultural bills than they are on other kind of bills. So it's incumbent on us here in Wisconsin to get involved in that. And finally, the last thing, and have you ever gone to a Catholic thing where you're not asked to give money? No? Okay. I, maybe they do a better job here. But we can donate money to the causes that we want to support. 
I mean, we can give money that we have. We're very blessed in the United States. Most of us have more money than we need. And as Bishop Skelba said, it's important for us to have a healthy relationship with our material goods. And so we can support the Catholic ministries that work in the areas that we feel are important. And also the other, the secular ministries that work in other areas. And this is where I just want to talk real briefly about innkeepers. Just like the Good Samaritan had to rely on the innkeeper to help support the, the injured man on the side of the road when he left, we have to rely on innkeepers. And there are lots of great Catholic ministries that help us live out Catholic social teaching. The Society of St. Vincent de Paul, Catholic Charities, Catholic Relief Services. Um, lots of the different religious orders have various ministries here. I know the Augustinians have a great ministry here um, in town. We have the ability to support these ministries that do good work, and so I would call you to do that. So I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel. Thank you very much for being here this evening. I appreciate that. We have just a time for a couple questions, and the first one is for Bishop Skilba. Yes, yeah, sorry. I, did, I wanted to make sure you heard my question. Uh, of Jesus was a Pharisee, why is there so much... I can't read this. And Deacon Greg, sorry, I can't read the, this question. Why is there so much... Oh, animosity between him and of them. What give evidence to the points of Jesus and a Pharisee. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, for Bishop Skilba, uh, if Jesus was a Pharisee, why is there so much antagonism between him and them? And then the follow-up is, what evidence points to Jesus as a Pharisee? The Gospels were written uh, in their final form after the year 70. And many things had happened in Jerusalem prior, between the death of Jesus in about 30, 33, and uh, the right in form of the Gospels. One of the things that happened in Jerusalem was the persecution from Rome that destroyed the city of Jerusalem in the year 69 and 70. And as a result of that, parts of the Pharisees um, stayed close to the Jewish authorities, and others separated themselves. So uh, the Pharisees at the time of Jesus were, were very Jewish and very devoted to care for uh, the, the heart of Judaism. Only later on, and it's reflected in the Gospels, is there an antagonism or the beginning of antagonism between Jewish Christians um, and Jewish Pharisees. Um, it, it just was something that developed in the first century. That was not at the time of Jesus himself. The Gospels reflect what's going on in their society, which would be the 70s and 80s, but not the earlier time. And that's just always important to keep in mind. Does that make some kind of sense? I yeah. Uh, Rob, can you, for those who don't know anything about the Farm Bill, give a brief explanation about it? So every five years, the U.S. government um, passes what's known as the Farm Bill, and there are two major parts to the Farm Bill. There's the agricultural part of the Farm Bill that talks about crop insurance, uh, crop subsidies, um, those programs, and then the other half of it involves um, uh, food share, uh, or uh, which is the what colloquially known as food stamps. So it's out of the feeding welfare uh, programs. So in, here in Wisconsin, we call it food share. Um, and so every five years, a bill is passed, and then that forms the framework for federal law for the next, for the next five years. And so 2023 is the magic fifth year where it comes up. And so that 
um, the Farm Bill is a very important um, for farm policy, actual growing of crops, livestock, et cetera, domestic food share programs, and there are also many of the international feeding programs like Food for Peace, the Dole McGovern Act, is included in the Farm Bill. So, and I'm be around later to talk a little bit more if people have questions about that, so. Thank you. Um, I guess this, you each could answer this one. Um, which Catholic social justice, justice teaching do you think is the most important for teenagers to remember in their daily lives? So if you could each pick one, which do you think would be? So I'll take that one. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I couldn't hear her. Oh, sorry. Which Catholic social justice teaching do you think is important for the teenagers to remember? Oh, sorry. Rob, you want to take it? Go ahead. Um, all of them. <laughs> what, I would say, what I would say seriously on that is that um, it is important that you understand all of them and that you look at them, but I also think about all of us have different gifts and talents, and to think about the thing that is calling to you in terms of where you want to use your gifts and talents. Because, again, it's important for us to, again, listen to those promptings of the Spirit to get involved in kind of where we're called to be involved with. Um, and then, Bishop Skelba, you want well, to what, talk about? In light of the question, as I came to understand it, I thought about my own experience in early years when I was at St. Catherine's. Um, so that goes back a few years. But I initially, uh, signed up because I wanted, as a freshman in high school, I wanted to be a debater. And so I signed up to debate. Well, they said I wasn't a good debater. And so they turned me down for debating. But they sent me to the student newspaper. And they said, maybe I could work at the student newspaper. Well, I walked on the door at St. Catharines, knocked on the door, said, I'm here, I'd like to help. They said, you would probably be good getting ads for the Shield. <laughs> and so I went to Miller Flowers, I went to the banks, I got ads for the Shield. They recognize that each one of us has our own gifts. And, uh, and as, as we know from our own experience, looking back at our lives and how people, what people have asked us to do because they perceived we were good at doing that that they asked us to do, uh, we found ourselves going in certain directions in life. That comes to mind because of that question. I wanted uh, to be a debater. Well, they said I wasn't good at debating, but I was good at talking to people into making ads in the shield. Well, what they say we're good at, that's what we do because that's what we're asked to do. Uh, last question. Rob, political, not partisan. What happens when they support an abortion bill or another issue that is not in line with the Catholic faith? There aren't many. <laughs> So one of the things that we are called to be is involved in politics. And it's important for us to be involved in politics. But when we get involved as, as the church, it's important for us not to be partisan. And part of the reason for that is just a practical one, is that it diminishes our witness if we are partisan. So if we go into different political offices with Catholic social teaching, we're gonna have a very friendly conversation with them about some of these issues and a little more contentious conversation with them about others. And it's important that we have both of those conversations with them about that, in that we sort of pat them on the back when they're supportive of our issues, but also challenge them when they're not supportive of our issues. Now, in terms of voting, we are all called, those of us who are old enough to vote, have a political responsibility to vote. And we are called to vote with a well-formed conscience. And so we are, just like we do on all public issues, we're supposed to see, judge, and act. And that means looking at the issues, judging them in light of Catholic social teaching, and acting accordingly. Now, the other thing that I would say in terms of the laity it's very hard to be involved politically unless you are um, a partisan. I mean, they, if you're gonna run for public office, chances are you have to run in a political party. And so there are, and that, that's fine, that's the way our system works. 
but it's important that people are Catholics first and Republicans and Democrats second. But when the church is involved in a political action, it's very important for us to be involved in politics, but as a church, not to be partisan. Uh, we just have a couple of thank yous uh, to go through. Obviously, we thank you, uh, Bishop Skilba and Rob Shaldi, for being here. Um, we have mass intentions for each of you. Steve. Father Michael, thank you for your support. Chuck Janzer, who is our technology whiz, and without this, many, many people would be lost without his technology expertise. Karen Toonstra, who does our bulletin, um, and Kathy Manchester and Suzanne Cruz for the parish staff and all office support and communication. Members of the Human Concerns Commission and all their work in making this event happen. Um, Rob had said that we have a few on the books coming up, um, different talks, and so our next one will be November 6th um, of 2022, of Life and Dignity of the Human Person. And the reason why they're so spread out is um, we wanted to incorporate our Village Zed program, and so um, that's why they're spread out, is I could only give up so many classes um, for these important talks. So, <clears throat> yes, our students will be here for them. Um, so that's all I have. Bishop Skilba is doing our closing prayer. Um, thank you all for coming. We ask God to bless us, not only in our gathering and our listening and our talking and our praying, but also in being sent out to make a world that's different than it was when we walked in the door for all the reasons that God calls us to do. We, bless, we ask God to bless us on the way. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Bishop. Well, thank you. It's superb. I'm proud of you. Thank you. I really am I proud of you. Appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thank you so Hope much. Hope that makes some kind of sense. We better turn this off here. Otherwise well, I have no secrets. <laughs> no secrets, whatever.